Hello everyone and welcome back to Rick's Garage. I think this might be my favorite episode so far because today is the day Miss Vicky gets her new 271 turbocharger. Seems like nowadays, everywhere you look in the auto industry, you hear the word turbo. Turbo. Turbo engine. Turbo. Turbocharged turbo. But what's the big deal? What makes turbos so great? In order to answer that question, we're going to have to take a closer look at what a turbo is and what it does. All internal combustion engines fall under one of two categories, either naturally aspirated or NA or forced induction. Now in a naturally aspirated engine, air is drawn into the cylinder as the piston goes down, creating a vacuum. Now this air is drawn in at atmospheric pressure. Now it's the same pressure as what you're breathing right now. As the piston goes back up, it compresses the air that's been mixed with fuel before it's ignited at the top of the stroke. Now a forced induction engine works the exact same way, but has an extra component that the NA engine doesn't. That extra part is either a belt-driven supercharger or an exhaust-driven turbocharger, or in some rare cases, both. For an engine to generate more power, it needs to burn more fuel. But dumping lots of fuel into an engine isn't useful because it also needs a certain amount of air to maintain its air-fuel ratio. Traditionally, with NA engines, the only way to make it take in more air and make more power is to make things larger. Whether that's an intake, cylinder, or the engine block itself, in the world of NA, bigger is better. Now, forced induction flips the statement, there's no replacement for displacement on its head. With the help of a turbo, it allows a smaller displacement engine to breathe a similar amount of air as a larger naturally aspirated one. What we've got here is a pretty standard turbo, and before I get into the parts and pieces that make up this engineering marvel, I have to drop a shout out to a really rad dude who goes by the name of Spoolie Wizard. Now, when I was making this video, I reached out to the car community and asked for a donation of an old turbo. Not only did Spoolie Wizard hand this beauty over, he took the time out of his day to come over and drop it off himself. So good on you, sir. I really appreciate it. And guys, Spoolie Wizard's got some pretty cool content on Instagram, so check it out when you have a chance. So a turbocharger is made up of the appropriately named hot side, which is bolted to the engine's exhaust, the core or cartridge that has all the bearings and bushings in it, and then the cold side that draws in the fresh air and compresses it before sending it to the engine. If we take a look on the inside, it'll give you a better idea on how this baby works. So essentially the operation of a turbo is pretty simple. As exhaust gases enter in the housing, it spins up this exhaust turbine. The turbine is connected via a shaft to an impeller, and the impeller spins inside the intake housing. That will draw in fresh air as it's compressed and then fired out towards the intake. Now the center core, or the cartridge, is what does all the heavy lifting. Inside of this, there's a high performance bushing and bearing set, along with coolant and oil passages, that allow this turbine set to spin upwards of 100,000 RPM. Now obviously at that kind of RPM that's going to be generating a lot more boost than your engine wants. So some turbos are designed with what's called a wastegate, and essentially it's just a little flapper door. When the boost hits a certain level, there's an actuating arm that opens the wastegate, allowing the exhaust to bypass the turbine, slowing it down, generating less boost. So that's the bare bone basics of the components of a turbo and how they fit together to generate boost. If you're watching this because you're upgrading the turbo on your own 10th gen Civic, there's a couple of things you're going to need to do to catch up to the next part of the video. First, you're going to have to get rid of the car's underpan. Check out episode 13 that gives you instructions on how to do that. As well, remove the air intake box and snorkel, and disconnect the hot side of the charge piping for the intercooler. And of course, don't forget to disconnect the battery before you start. There's a few things that have to be removed to get access to the turbo. We're going to start with the turbo intake piping. This is the main tube that feeds fresh air to the turbocharger. There's also a few things that have to be removed from this before we can get it out of the engine bay. Now, I chose to remove the hose connection on the EVAP bleed air, but if you want to remove it from the TIP completely, there's two 10mm bolts holding it in. Disconnect the wastegate actuator wiring harness and get it out of the way by popping it out of the bracket. Loosen the hose clamp on the valve cover breather tube, and I found it easier to leave this all connected until the very end. The TIP has two 10mm mounting bolts and that stabilizes it to the engine, and there's also a bypass and EGR hose that have to be disconnected too. Once that's all done, the three bolts and a nut, which are a little tricky to locate, can be removed. And with the loosening of a couple of brackets, the TIP is wrestled out of the engine bay. 
The downpipe heat shield is pretty straightforward with three 12mm bolts holding it in. The O2 sensor plugs are to the right, and once separated, pop the wire out of this bracket before removing it with an O2 sensor socket. If you're not familiar, an O2 sensor socket has a cutout on the side so the wiring doesn't get damaged. Once the sensor is out, there's two 12mm and two 10mm bolts holding the other heat shield down. By this point, the downpipe has been removed from the turbo. I'll have details on that in the exhaust upgrade episode. With the downpipe out of the way, it gives access to the turbo support bracket. Two 14mm bolts hold this in. If you're doing this yourself, be aware that the bolts here are two different lengths, so don't mix them up. Also on the bottom of the turbo is the oil return line. Make sure to save the metal gasket here as we'll need it later. Disconnect the oil feed line on top of the turbo along with a couple of coolant connections and the turbo is ready to come out. Now that I've got the factory turbo on the bench next to the W1 made by 271, you can see how unassuming this turbo really is. At first glance, it's a factory unit. The casting's the same, and 271 designed it that way, and that makes it a drop-in unit. And that means that all the factory brackets, bolt holes, even the gaskets will line up exactly as the factory unit would. Even the wastegate actuator bolts in the same place on the aftermarket unit. That all being said, that's where the similarities stop. If we take a closer look, you can see that there's a big difference between these turbines. That's a 60% difference. In fact, all the internals are beefed up compared to the factory turbo. I've got a bit of work to do here on the bench, swapping over some parts and pieces, and then this unit will be ready to install.
right, that is job done. Now, that was a lot of work, but a lot of fun at the same time. Big thank you to Vincent and the whole 271 crew for making such an awesome product. Just like Vincent said in our interview, everything that I needed was either included in the box or the OEM stuff still worked. So by far the easiest aftermarket turbo I've ever installed. Plus the instructions were so well written, it took all the guesswork out of the process. So phase two only has one episode left before Miss Vicky can head back to the tuners and we can see the result of all the bolt-ons that she's received. So if you've enjoyed what you've watched, make sure to hit that like button. As well, don't forget to subscribe and get instant notifications as soon as a new episode is ready. And as always, thanks very much for watching.